Thank you very much, um, Stefano and Andrea, for the invitation. Um, it's a pleasure being, you know, being here online with all of you. Um, this is uh, um, something I've actually accepted thinking, oh, it's a, it's a little talk, and then I've realized that uh, being online, um, the audience is much wider and uh, larger than I expected. Uh, so um, I don't have an awful lot of time uh, today. Um, um, and I was asked for a kind of a keynote type of um, uh, talk, uh, which is quite hard to do it in 40 minutes. So I, I might have put too much on this uh, presentation, I'll have to go very quickly. Uh, what I'm presenting today is a series of studies looking at inequality um, using uh, spatial analysis and in the end a bit of modeling uh, that uh, I have developed uh, in the last uh, years with uh, quite a large um, partnership uh, and I will uh, present uh, some of those studies they focus either on segregation or, access or on accessibility and in, in London in Sao Paulo mainly and I'll end up with some reflections on, on the challenges that we had I mentioned uh, some of them while we, we go along as well so uh, all started, or everything that I'm presenting today have either started or been a spin-off or related to uh, a project called Resolution, Resilient uh, Systems for Land Use Transportation, that explore the relationship between transport uh, and segregation in, in a comparison uh, fashion, uh, looking at both Sao Paulo and London. And uh, here is all the people that have worked uh, with me in this project, and I um, I have the pleasure to continue working with, with some of them as well. I have included some of the um, um, link um, references to uh, publications that are coming out on, on some of those things. Some projects I'm presenting are ongoing. So a little bit about Sao Paulo and, and London. So uh, very large cities. We were looking at metropolitan areas. Uh, so Sao Paulo is very well known by socioeconomic inequalities, although it, we all know that it's a very large city, London is better known for its diversity. Um, but it, we had this challenge that was to try to apply the same concepts and, and technologies uh, and look at um, those uh, inequalities in both of the cities from the global south and north in, in the same fashion. Uh, one of the first challenges of, of this project and one that we spent a considerable amount of time was to establish whether they were uh, actually comparable in terms of size, population and data. And there's a, a number of differences that make uh, this uh, comparison quite challenging, including the way that uh, the urban area is, is distributed, as you can see on these maps. So uh, London, is, um, Sao Paulo uh, on, on the right hand side is much uh, denser than London, but then uh, there is much more uh, sp spread, uh, fragmented uh, uh, morphology in, in London. So we've worked with the administrative area of um, a metropolitan area of Sao Paulo uh, that is uh, legally defined, and we had to find an equivalent one for London that we defined as the area that um, had um, at least 10% of people uh, working uh, in London, commuting to London. So this is this little uh, area here, and that actually takes pride on Reading, so it's a very, very large area. And here's a, a, a very quick um, 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 maps of uh, the transport system that are also very different. Okay, so we were looking at accessibility and segregation um, as uh, in, 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 we thought that um, there were a lot of metrics uh, out there, there's a lot of methodology, so, oh, you know, we were quite naive to think, oh, we are going to use them, that's going to be, you know, quite straightforward. Um, and very soon we've realized that these both concepts, as well as some of the metrics, are very slippery. Um, and this was one of the challenges that we, we had throughout this project. Our main challenge, or the way I like to think about the challenge um, when dealing with inequalities, is that we are trying to map concepts, we are trying to map the invisible. Uh, things that we know, nobody doubts their inequalities, I mean, if anything, um, COVID has um, shown them uh, to us uh, as a slap on the face. Um, but um, in order to tackle those, we, we do have to be able to um, um, show where they exist and, and their magnitude. Uh, and that is kind of in terms of the overall goal of what I'm going to show. 
So the first uh, part study I'm going to, to, to present is, is uh, the ethno-racial segregation uh, study in London, São Paulo. Here, the first challenge was to find um, groupings that were uh, comparable uh, ethnic groups in, in the census for uh, the UK have the 18 variables, while Brazil actually has race and five, and we have to um, combine them um, and find four groups that were more or less the same. Uh, so uh, we used kind of white, white British, uh, other uh, Asian and black, and where the, the black mixed it goes. So um, we use segregation indices. I'm not getting much uh, into those. Uh, we've used a variety of them, including a similarity index theory of uh, information that which I, I'm not going to present today. But um, most uh, of the things I will present are used either isolation or exposures. Exposure indices, which is basically um, uh, an index that allows us to investigate the spatial relationship between these different groups. So it, in a very simple way, uh, the exposure can be interpreted as the likelihood that uh, someone uh, living in a neighborhood will get out of the house and meet someone of an X group, or it's, if it's the same group that they belong to, then that would be considered uh, isolation. Um, these indices are slippery, perhaps one of the most uh, of them all, and one of the issues that we have is that they are dependent to the proportion of groups in the, the overall study area. So we've used the normalized version for some of them uh, in order to uh, mitigate these problems. We've also used uh, a number of local um, indices to, to be able to map um, those concentrations. Um, I'm not getting into the details of, of how we've done this and I will focus on the findings from now on. So um, what I'm showing here, the local uh, isolation uh, index uh, maps for London and Sao Paulo. So here you have uh, London and Sao Paulo. And this is the white, black, uh, Asian and other. And here we are only showing uh, two for, for Sao Paulo because uh, the, the Asian and uh, um, indigenous, that is the, the, the group for, for, for uh, Sao Paulo, very uh, small groups. And one of the first things that was quite interesting was to see how both looking at the white and, and black for both cities, uh, that you actually had an, almost an opposite uh, core periphery sort of um, um, pattern in which the, the white is in the, in the uh, peripheral area, let's say, um, of London and in the core of Sao Paulo, and black is the exactly opposite. And that was an interesting thing. We've, we've explored this in, in more detail, I'm not getting here, but I think the most in, interesting uh, result of this study that is yet to be published is uh, that uh, when we looked at overall um, um, indices and the measurements for segregation between the two cities, London was actually more segregated than than uh, than Sao Paulo, and it, it, this was so so surprising that we thought the measurements were wrong, and we had to redo them all and to try them many different ways until we finally concluded that that was actually correct, that was consistently higher, and that's mainly because we were looking at ethnic groups and not uh, socioeconomic, um, but uh, it was still quite a, a surprise here. There, there, there are um, a number of studies suggest that in more diverse areas tend to be more segregated. So I guess um, it's related to that. So um, we've looked also a little bit further into uh, the segregation uh, of socioeconomic groups in Sao Paulo, which we thought that were more a, a better way to to look. Uh, at Sao Paulo, and we've used the patient classes as, as proxy uh, for those socioeconomic groups. I'm not getting into detail of them. And what we know about the segregation of Sao Paulo is that there is a spatial pattern that is uh, uh, concentric. The high classes are living in the center, and the low classes live in the peripheral ring. And the recent uh, studies suggest there is a, there has been a change to this pattern with an increase in, in heterogeneity of areas, and that is an increase of subcentralities and the, the peripheral areas are more fragmented. And that uh, was believed in the, in the period between 2000 and 2010. 
I think that's important to stress. Uh, there was a, a change in residential preferences of the higher um, classes um, that are now more keen in living in gated communities. But also during this period, uh, there was an economic, uh, uh, the economic situation in Brazil uh, uh, was uh, quite good. So there was uh, an improving the quality of life and uh, um, and the overall economic growth. So there was a belief that this was would have an impact on the, the levels of, of segregation. Um, this is not actually what we have observed. Um, we've, we've realized there was an increase um, in, in segregation levels overall, uh, that the high class was still the most isolated uh, uh, group. This is uh, in line with what we already knew. And the, one of, and although the, the low income is not the most isolated, it's uh, it's it's the one that um, are is located in areas so they suffer most with the segregation areas. Um, in overall findings, we found that there was this increase despite economic growth. Quite worrying considering how bad things have gone to Brazil since. So uh, if in an if in an area of economic growth, the level of segregations have increased, you know, I, I despair to think what's going to happen when, when and if we manage to, to reproduce the study with, um, with the census of 2021. Um, uh, we've seen an increase in fragmentation and heterogeneity in the peripheral areas as, as expected, but this mixture was not between the polarized classes. There was no evidence of the increase between the high and low class. What we, we've seen is that classes that were close together, they were, um, they were a bit more integrated, especially the middle, middle, low. Um, the gated community side by side, according to the results we got, remains an exception uh, rather than rules. So gated communities and informal settlements, we see a lot of, of those photos in the media, but that is quite an exception. Um, and what we found was that there was a, a, an increasing separation between the high and the low classes. And the maps show that um, there is uh, the low income groups are further isolated in the peripheral areas, and there is also a decrease uh, of their presence in the central areas of the city. So, um, this is actually a reinforcement of the core periphery pattern that we had hoped that had, were changing. So, it only looks that this is patterns getting a bit more uh, complex and but we are not moving into an alternative uh, spatial segregation pattern uh, for Brazil. Um, and that was quite interesting. Now, shown a bit of ethnic group and then, uh, you know, what the, the socioeconomic issue is. Um, and then we've decided to investigate a little bit further the, 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 the racial aspect. Um, in Brazil, there is something that we call the myth of racial democracy. That's basically believed by everyone on that uh, until not long ago included myself that segregation of Brazil is is a socioeconomic um, um, phenomenon and it's not a racial issue at all I think we all like to think that we are not um, there's no racism in our societies uh, and we do know that there's a strong race, uh, correlation between race and income in Brazil but uh, some recent studies have shown that there might be um, um, there was some evidence that racial differences might be an active driver of segregation and we've decided to, to look into that by uh, taking the micro data from the Brazilian census of 2010 and classifying in a, into a combined income and racial classes. So we got two major classes, the black and white. The black is where uh, it includes the mixed white and black. That is um, it's something that is typical in Brazilian studies. Uh, we've excluded uh, the, the, the classes with small representation and then we've classified them uh, between A, a B, C and D according to the different income levels. So you have uh, 10 different classes. And we then plotted, um, we've calculated the, the, the exposure and uh, isolation index, and this is what we call the, the normalized version. That means that we've divided by the, the proportion to try to minimize the, the effect and make it a bit more com comparable, the, the effect of, of the, the um, different um, 
proportions of the groups in, in the overall city. So what you have here is a reference value that is, is one. Anything close to this would be um, similar to a, a non-segregated distribution or the equivalent of what was expected in, in a non-segregated distribution. Then what you have here is, is isolation. And here what we have is the, the whites in, in uh, um, blue and the blacks in, in red. And for each of these, um, uh, graphs will show the exposure or the income to each group to all the other ones. And this is, is it, it takes quite a lot of uh, detail to, um, um, to analyze and, and what we have done is to, we went to each of those and have done some, some analysis on them. So here, for example, you have this very high uh, peak is, is the isolation of, uh, of the, the white. Uh, high income that is the, 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 the highest, the most segregated and the highest isolation of all of them. I'll go, we've also looked at, at, um, at the, the, uh, the same results for the metropolitan region of, of Rio, not only Sao Paulo, and we looked at both. And I will just talk a little bit about the results on the overall. So what we had um, was that one of the things we found was the isolation for the white high income is much higher than the black income to start with. Uh, the isolation of the black lowest income, that E, is, is higher than uh, the, uh, the, 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 the black high income. The black high income is most exposed to white rather than black groups. The, iso the isolation of the black uh, low income is higher than the white. Uh, uh, low income. Uh, and very interesting, if we look on, on the overall, the black classes, they tend to present a, a pattern uh, of exposure that's similar to the uh, lower income range on the white group. When we looked at, at the maps, so here we, it's, these are uh, local isolation maps for Sao Paulo, this white high income, uh, white low income, black white income, high income, and black low. So you would expect to have the same pattern. And indeed, you see that the high incomes, they are all concentrated in the center of the city. However, uh, the, the black groups are much more dispersed than the, than the whites. Uh, on here, on the low income, we would expect them both to be in the peripheral ring, and indeed they are. But uh, again, the white is slightly more concentrated uh, and closer to the central areas than, um, than the black. And the same thing happens in Rio. It's a little bit different to analyze. This is the, 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 uh, the sea and uh, the central areas are closer to the coast. Uh, and then you have the same thing here uh, with the white high income uh, much more concentrated in the, in the, um, in the central areas and the, the black lower income more dis dis dispersed and a bit more present in uh, the peripheral ring. So um, what we've found so far uh, is that um, what, what our findings corroborate with what we know about segregation of Brazilian cities in terms of the most segregated groups that are the highest income and also the allocation. But what this an, a combined analysis of income and race together have provided some, some um, interesting insights. Um, so although the income plays a very important role in the definition of, of the segregation spatial part, uh, it became quite evident that the, the role of race has been underestimated. There is also a clear uh, evidence so far uh, that of, of segregation, of racial segregation or spatial segregation between the same income groups with a clear distinction of spatial patterns between the high income white and, and black groups. So what we have found so far is that there is evidence uh, that integration between uh, income groups actually is strongly uh, mediated by race. Um, this is an ongoing project. We are looking into uh, five different metropolitan areas and looking into different uh, regional um, areas in Brazil to see uh, what happens, especially because they have different uh, uh, compositions, but also kind of uh, uh, historically also uh, is, is quite different and there, there's suggestion there's some impacts on that. 
Um, but back to the um, to London San Paulo comparison. Um, I've mentioned before that we are looking at accessibility and segregation. So one of the things we have uh, thought uh, that was interesting would be to look at um, segregation on uh, both the residential but also on the workplace. And then that, that would link in, it, it makes some interesting links with accessibility that again is, is accessibility from home to, to, to jobs. So we've used occupational groups uh, for this one, and here again, the, the, the local isolation indices, and what um, this is Sao Paulo, and what you see here is uh, the residential patterns on the top, and the workplace on, on the low, and it's quite interesting to see there is a clear difference between uh, the where uh, residents are located, but um, workplaces are very similar, and we found the same. Uh, a very similar thing to 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 London. Um, when we look at inequality in, in transport, um, you know, so kind of making the, the jump uh, from residential workplace to looking at um, at commute, um, it was it was this spatial distribution of opportunities where the jobs was, was quite important and also the location of, of residential areas. We've used different metrics, um, mainly gravitational and, and cumulative, but we had to adapt uh, some of them. And I'll start by showing this map of uh, the gravitational accessibility per occupational group. So this is the highest class, this is for Sao Paulo, uh, and then the lowest class. And I'll tell you to pay a lot of uh, attention to both maps and see if you can see any difference, because uh, that was one of the problems we had. It was, we thought that we would disaggregate um, the, the accessibility in groups and we'll see great difference and it was, it was like you, you really cannot uh, visualize them this way. So we've gone through quite a, 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 a lot of exploratory uh, options on how we could extract this and I'm not getting into this study because it would take me at least 40 minutes to get it but this has re recently been um, been published and you can see here that we've used a variety of um, uh, metrics of accessibility but also have to um, use to, to plot them uh, in Lorenz curves and uh, Gini values and so on in order to try to understand. The result in terms of accessibility was um, overall uh, very expected for some power. So what I'm showing here is a, a normalized person weighted mean accessibility. That's one of the ways we've managed to, 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 to plot accessibility for the different groups. And this is from the highest to the lowest and long here the long term more or less the same uh, groups. And what they, they, they what this shows is the average accessibility for each occupational class um, and how it relates to the average accessibility for all residents in this study area. Okay? So what you see from Sao Paulo is this, the high economic classes are have much higher accessibility than the lowest. This is expected. But for London, it wasn't that straightforward. Uh, and I'll come a little bit. Um, uh, more detail here because what we had here just to, to start the managers the, the higher income classes they had very um, like average uh, accessibility and we can explain that by the preference of you know where those people tend to live that they tend to have uh, um, um, to live in, in faraway areas like out the outskirts um, in more rural areas that's a preference and have larger communities that's fine then what we have is the professional and the associate professionals here with high um, accessibility, which is expected. And then here, the, all these other classes have lower. And then when you get to the very elementary uh, ones, it's the lowest economic class, then you can see that they are very close to the average one as well. And that was quite interesting because we've concluded that this is related still to kind of um, uh, social housing in inner city locations in London that still brings those groups uh, on, on, on average, of course, uh, in, in, into a, a, a 
allowing them to live in, in, in central areas and have very, very high accessibilities in, in comparison to, to others. So that, that, that was quite uh, interesting. This is much further explored in, in uh, the paper in the book chapter that I'm showing here. Okay, so uh, we've looked at all these uh, static things, but um, one of the frustrations we had was how do we visualize uh, these differences? And uh, so we've tried, a student of mine developed an agent-based model to uh, looking at dynamics of, of movement. And that the access model that is accessibility versus segregation. And his objective was to simulate um, um, uh, to, to bridge a gap or in the data set that they basically simulate a, an available individual based uh, data set that these trajectories in time, uh, in space and time, um, from data that's available, that's made, made mainly um, origin, destination, matrices, and travel survey data sets, uh, in order to then uh, be able to understand individual based accessibility and segregation and, and, and measure them based on those uh, simulated trajectories. I'm not getting to the detail of, of, of his model here, um, but I will um, say a little bit of, I will show what he's done. So he generates a pattern of flows by uh, simulating these artificial uh, trajectories. What he, he, is a, he can do with this model is to disaggregate in almost any group that he can and then he can compare the spatial patterns of flows. So he used uh, here what he, he worked with the Greater Lona Authority, not the metropolitan area, um, and he um, took the main road network from OpenStreetMap. And I'll go straight into uh, showing a couple of videos. This is uh, part of um, the study that he's done on accessibility inequalities in, in, in Sao Paulo, in the metropolitan region. Uh, and um, Hopefully this will work and you'll see this, this video here uh, to see what he's done. So uh, this is income groups uh, for Sao Paulo. This is the network and you'll see here what the model does. This is kind of real time. It's not, um, we haven't, it's not this a speedy um, 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 things. And you can see that all these little dots, they are, his agents, this is, uh, this is a sample of uh, uh, 200,000 trips out of 8, 8 million uh, commuting trips. And here is the combined one. And then he disaggregated those, um, those sample, those agents into different uh, income classes here. And then you can start seeing how they uh, travel in the city in, in, in very different ways. Uh, so the upper class here that lives very in the center and, and works in the center will be very much concentrated in certain areas. Uh, it's quite interesting if you know some of you also see some of the, the gated communities, um, the high income gated communities uh, here. And then you can really see on the other extreme, the lower class that is really traveling from uh, very far away. Um, areas into the center of the city and we do know uh, from data that these are people that are that have to leave at the, the house at five o'clock in the morning in order to get to to work because they will face quite a number of hours uh, traveling um, so he's done a very uh, uh, similar thing here for uh, for the GLA um, looking at ethnic groups in, in London uh, again, uh, the same uh, type of of, sun, uh, of uh, sample, and here he will he, he used the same um, uh, four groups that we've used for the first study of segregation that's shown, and it's quite interesting. Again, um, uh, the maps below will show the work uh, place distribution and the residen residential distribution per ethnic group, um, and very soon we'll see how those groups um, are disaggregated in, in this um, model. Let's see. Um, here it is the white British, uh, the black, black mixed, uh, the South Asian, and uh, you see that as um, the, mod, the, the agents travel and um, kind of draw the lines on, on the 
the roads that are being um, traveled uh, one then um, you, you start seeing a, a, a pattern emerging I think I'll start this year and and what first that I we thought it was quite interesting to see the differences and how social groups uh, different social groups use different uh, urban spaces in this case the street a network um, but it was also quite interesting to see how uh, these uh, trajectories allow us to study the segregation from a more dynamic and individual based uh, perspective without um, actually having the individual data sets and what um, Marcus has done from there was to uh, adapt some of those uh, metrics that we have used um, in order to use flows uh, and then um, measure the accessibility inequalities this is, is in Sao Paulo so here he has uh, used education groups and income and then he um, he's shown all the, those differences. He has also uh, done this for some problem with gender and was really, really interesting. I don't have time to get into this. Uh, and just to show you here, uh, he's done a similar thing with segregation. So here is what uh, he called the relative co-presence. Um, this is the information theory index um, um, follow, um, adapted for um, measure in, in flows. So it, it um, just kind of shows another uh, aspect of, of segregation and um, accessibility and inequality here. Okay, so I seem to have got um, to, the, to the end of this um, and I just wanted to have to, to do a couple of uh, reflections on, on this. So um, we, we started I think uh, this um, projects uh, and these studies, um, quite confident that we we're going to, you know, show all the inequality we knew that existed and that was going to be somehow very straightforward. Um, but uh, it's not. There are many reasons um, that this is, this is not. And I think in part for us is because we, especially in terms of the transport, we are using a set of methodologies that have not been designed for that. Um, so there's uh, quite a lot uh, of work still required for us to 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 fully be able to to measure and, and visualize those inequalities. Um, so there's more and more people I think um, um, working with this this these matters. This is very positive. I think it's said um, more than ever. I think COVID has shown us how important um, such inequalities and, and and real these inequalities are. And I am a firm believer that in order to tackle this inequality, we need first to be able to visualize and measure them. Uh, we do live in an area of, with abundance of, of data. There is more, more big data out there. However, when we look at big data, although there's a lot of interesting studies uh, of inequality, there are some, some real challenges in, in, in the way that is, um, you know, the sample is skewed or also we don't have the, the required uh, socioeconomic um, characteristics, uh, variables in, in the data, so it can be quite uh, tricky to use big data to study inequality. But I think for more importantly, and that's what I was referring to before, is that even with very good quality data, even knowing um, exactly the pattern that we think we, you, we will find, uh, visualizing inequalities is still a challenge that, that requires further uh, effort and, and more effective methods. You notice in the studies I presented, we have uh, tried to to use um, what I call traditional database and census and what is uh, available there. In part of this is uh, working with the cities in the global south, where um, that is you know and trying to take the most out of the data uh, that we've got. And and for that, we had. To, um, to face the challenges of, of, of working with um, methodologies that have uh, a lot of, of different issues and, and can be a little, little bit slippery at times. And we say that for most of the studies that we have done and all the analysis we have done, we usually have um, an even larger set of uh, footnotes with the limitations and, uh, and things that we have to be careful and assumptions that we are making. 
So um, this is what I had to show for you today. I'm very sorry it was so quick, uh, but here's my email and I would be very happy um, to hear from you if um, you, if, you know, or for, for your questions right now, but also afterwards if there is uh, anything else. Stuff All right, thank you, Joanna. I think that was that was great. Um, thank you for the very interesting talk. I hope um, I hope my audio is a bit better now. I, I don't I don't I don't dare switching on the the camera. Um, okay, that's fantastic. So. Um, Please, please do type your questions for Joanna uh, in uh, in the chat. Also, you know, um, say whatever comment you have. Um, I think we have uh, one, possibly two questions from Maurice Glucksman. Um, I also have at least one question, maybe more, that I would like to ask. But uh, I will go with Maurice's question first. So the first one, it's uh, just probably a detail uh, about the uh, agent-based modeling that you were showing. And the question is, what was the time scale, whether it was per day, per week, per month uh, in the simulation? So what, what is the time scale of the simulation? Um, we we were not really trying to simulate a specific time. So it was uh, if if I go back to the to the objective, it was really kind of um, you know how do we um, bridge a gap in, in the um, in the data sets we 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 do not ha hold. So uh, the idea there was to to use the model in a kind of alternative way that is to produce um, a set of artificial data sets that. Um, we can then use to simulate to 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 understand or to measure uh, the segregation. Um, there has been a lot of validation exercises in that, um, which I would, to be honest, not be able to de to detail myself. But uh, basically, it is we are not trying to to simulate a, a day. We were just kind of to 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 look at tendencies, if 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 you wish. So that was basically done. You, we, we took the OD data origin destination and then made those uh, trips um, using a particular algorithm that is not um, a, a, the shortest path and trying to understand, you know, what, what is the likelihood that this, uh, you know, what is the likely route that, that, that people would use uh, going from home to work and vice versa. Thank you. Uh, I think there is a follow-up question uh, from Maurice asking whether you use different uh, census dates um, and whether whether you use whether you run the model using data from different censuses um, to, to see whether there is being a change over time or whether you you been you will plan to do that or is something that, that might be interesting for the for the model. Yes. Uh, no, I actually think that. We have we haven't done that. I think um, it's possible, um, but I'm not I'm not sure that that would be you know the the, the yeah usually change I think you know the the, the change is, is more um, a static uh, um, mm -hmm. sort of study. But yeah, to be honest, I haven't crossed my mind to do that for for that particular one. But uh, so no, yeah. we we have not done that. But uh, thanks for the suggestion. Yeah, at least not yet. Um, then we have a question from uh, Morgan Cummins. Um, and this is going somewhere towards what actually I was going to ask as well. So um, uh, Morgan said, there are assumptions in the modeling accessibility and there need to be made explicit. Makes a sense that people seek to minimize their commute, yet higher economic classes in London tend to value living further from the city in the countryside, investment in infrastructure further uh, favor those classes uh, to reduce their commute time, and this also goes towards uh, something that I was uh, I was going to ask about whether and this is probably a very easy question to ask, probably a very difficult question to answer. Um, for instance, in the current situation with COVID and with many people, especially those who are high, have higher income and have sort of like white collar jobs, and you know this this kind of uh, this kind of situation we work more and more from home so how does what does accessibility mean um 
in this current situation, which is probably not anymore like accessibility to the city center or to many other parts of London, maybe it's just, you know, accessibility to certain services. Yeah, okay, so uh, I'll get to the first part first. Uh, yes, about the different assumptions, yes, there is a number of them. And uh, said I, I was attempting to cover a very large number of studies in, in 30 minutes, and uh, I just have not seem to, to kind of brush through quite a lot, and I do apologize for that. But yes, there is there is a number of, of, of things that we, 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 we assume there. Um, um, in terms of what accessibility accessibility means, um, you know, with COVID or post COVID, it's interesting. I have been um, attending um, an, a series of webinars um, that uh, it's kind of a modeling conference that organized by by Cambridge lately, and uh, this is, has been their main theme. Uh, it was um, um, one of the studies that I I've, I've seen was of someone who actually managed. We were doing a different study on mobility and they had a number of people um, with mobile phones uh, you know tracking their movement just before the lockdown and they've continued tracking those people and uh, what they've uh, you know during the lockdown and, uh, and up to now and uh, what they've revealed was quite interesting that yes um, um, movement from from work to to home to work have decreased, but uh, people still go out a lot, uh, just not in the same pattern. So basically, if you work from home uh, all day, then at the end of the at some point of the day, you've got to go out. So what they were um, trying to 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 speculate, I guess, is um, whether there would be much less traffic in a post-COVID, you know, or non-commuting reality, or if it was just going to be a change in nature. There's quite a lot of questions there, you know, I mean, and no position to answer them, but uh, um, I think there will be quite a, a, a lot of interesting studies uh, coming from this, especially as, you know, whether we we are going to change the way we live and um, and work, or by the end of all this lockdown, we'll be so fed up of uh, talking to computers and not seeing faces that we will be very keen to travel even more. Indeed, I think we have all been mostly talking to our own computers for, for a few <laughs> months now. Um, there is a, a message from Evelyn or Evelyn, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Um, and they, uh, she mentions about um, some work uh, that I think they have been doing, uh, which um, using some big data um, to cluster ethnic, she say ethnicity ethnicities so ethnicity and cities together yeah. uh, so trying to look at more sort of by ethnical background rather than just black and white uh, yeah. and how that would you know I think it's general common but I think that's a really good question I mean how do we uh, look at um, ethnicity and uh, race and their their impact on accessibility or you know how accessibility impact different communities and I think that also partially might depend to the kind of data that you are they have available there are countries that don't record but by sort of like by uh, by law they don't record ethnicity or race uh, other countries that go into very much detail in their census so I guess that also fairly dependent on the availability of data from census yeah, uh, th there is a there's a, a, a lot to be said about uh, you know those, those data sets, and I think it's amazing when people actually manage to use big data to um, to to study inequalities. Um, and what we really need there are, there are some basic things we need to, in order to, to look at inequalities, and one is you know is the characteristics of of, of the people, um, and in most uh, cases, uh, um, let's say in Twitter, this is inferred rather than stated. So, you know, and if you're looking outside inequality, you would have uh, issues of representativity. Um, so there is a challenge, I think, in, in using those, uh, those, those data sets. Um, and, you know, but there's also a lot of potential. So I think this is one of the things that we, 
um, in the future that I hope we, we can we can work more and have more more access to to these data sets and also be able to combine them hopefully um, in order to 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 understand inequality better. So I don't know. It's this is just kind of a, a general comment. I I not sure I've I've responded to to the to the comment or the question, but uh, I would definitely be interested in in seeing um, you know learning more from from your study or any other studies out there that are on on this. Yep, thank you. I I think uh, they they can get in com in contact if they are interested. Um, oh, we have a comment or question from Andrea. Um, he says surprising that London result more segregated than Sao Paulo, considering social housing pattern for which London is famous, more segregated just in some specific metrics or all or metrics that you have used. Uh, if so, which ones? And I think it, this also relates to another question, another comment from Morgan. Uh, who is, was mentioning the issue of gentrification and how that is changing patterns in London. Yeah, um, uh, that was a big surprise. But we, uh, we were so surprised that um, we had a research assistant doing these calculations. And uh, and as soon as we thought, said, oh, he made a mistake, you know, let's, um, you know, let's, let's tell him to, to redo. And, and we've asked him to redo everything because we thought there was definitely a mistake there. <laughs> um, and then it was not. Now, one of the things I should say about segregation metrics is that they are, you know, you cannot really establish a, a threshold. So um, um, the way we are confident that um, London is actually more segregated in ethnic um, groups uh, than Sao Paulo is uh, because all of our um, analysis, all the results confirm that. Um, and uh, it was also kind of, when we looked at the the, um, the spatial patterns, there was you know there was, everything was, was coming together. So we were quite confident about this result, but it was 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 very surprising um, indeed. Um, uh, again, you, you you know what you have to remember is this is for ethnic groups. Um, so London is more diverse, so it has more groups. So it, and there is a tendency um, of diverse places um, to to have more um, segregation and and some of the segregation that has to be considered um, is is due to to preferences to cultural different preferences you know there is there's a lot of advantage, advantages in living in an area um, you know close and near your own not only because of the interaction of people but also kind of you know shops and things you buy you know like i'm brazilian i'd love to live in an area where i could buy um, easily brazilian products uh, and this is one of the many things and uh, communities and so on that um, there are so there is a preference there yes andrea is talking about getting good eats in italian areas yes mm -hmm. it is advantage of segregation <laughs> But uh, so that is one of the things uh, I think is tricky about segregation that um, even on, on all the Brazilian studies, the high income is always the most segregated, um, but it's not the one that suffers more with the segregation. Uh, so there is an, 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 when we look at the segregation metrics, they are measuring a specific aspect um, and they are not always, um, you know, the, the highest segregation is not necessarily the, the, the one that has the, the highest level of problem. Mm. And I think we just got a message from uh, Tiago Souza, I guess. Um, the, uh, and they, they say, um, I think there is an historical background in, I mean, segregation in Brazil has its background related to uh, slavery in the 19th century, which I, again, I think it's uh, some, some level of segregation cha in, in many countries depend on this kind of histories and especially in the yeah. general, more general history of immigration, um, you know, whether it's a recent immigration or relatively old immigration. Yeah, I think that's that's definitely the case. And, uh, you know, I think what happened in, in terms of, of racial uh, residential segregation in Brazil is that um, the, the social, it, it, there is, it's a, it's a historical uh, aspect in the sense that, um, you know, because of the slavery, um, historically, uh, those people, those groups never had an opportunity to, to you know, to, um, to overcome the challenges that were imposed, you know, uh, 
in, term, in economic terms an opportunity uh, because of, of that. Um, and we, we kind of assumed, oh, it's no longer, uh, you know, a, a racial uh, issue. It's just a socioeconomic one. And I think um, it's quite difficult to try to, um, to analyze and, and try to, ex you know, to extract, is there a, an aspect of this that is, it is racial? Are, are, are differences there or, or they are all embedded in, into this historical process with, uh, you know, that is become socioeconomic. Um, and so it, it, this is one of the, the studies that we are doing now of, of the race in Brazil, and, and I find it really fascinating. Um, looking into details, we started looking at uh, different cities in different areas, and we already see the areas that had more uh, influx of, uh, of slaves uh, at the time and have a higher proportion of the population that is um, black or mixed black. There's some, some, some interesting dif differences uh, between the cities in those areas. So uh, yeah, something I am, I'm quite um, intrigued and I'm happy to be involved with. Fantastic. And we have a question from Lawrence Bate, who's asking, are you looking to do similar study in other cities? Do you think other South American cities will have a similar profile to Sao Paulo and Rio? Yeah, I said, what we are doing now is to looking at um, metropolitan areas, different metropolitan areas within Brazil. So we're looking at five, probably we might even expand a bit further. Haven't looked at any other cities um, in, in Latin America, but I have a student that's looking at uh, Cape Town in South Africa in a, in a similar study, which is also very, very interesting. A, a little bit, the you know, the, the opposite that there you, you think that's all, all race, and the question there becomes, um, you know, how, what is the role of, of uh, the economic aspect in this segregation or, you know, does it help integrating uh, those racial groups or not? So that's what he's looking at. Um, so yes, uh, we are looking at, at, at some, some of those similar ones. I will be interested in, in looking at other Latin American cities, but uh, I haven't had that opportunity yet. Brilliant. Maybe we can get you back next year with, with an update. Um, so if there are other questions, I think we have, still have a handful of minutes um, to spare. Um, yes, there are, there are a few people interested in collaborating and working yes, on Vienna. Please contact me <laughs> with any collaborations. I would be very happy to, to hear from you, uh, you know, and get, get together, maybe do a kind of uh, segregation inequalities, uh, webinar series uh, be inspired by Andrea and Stefano's wonderful book. I, I will take sort of like chair uh, privilege and ask a question which is close to one close interest of mine which I've never been able to indulge in uh, which is citizen science. Do you think there might be a chance to do this kind of accessibility study involving some of the most um, sort of like deprived communities and trying to get them involved or do you know uh, any study that actually actively involve the communities in understanding what accessibility means for them? Yeah, um, one of my partners, my research partners, that Mariana Gianotti from uh, the University of São Paulo, um, she has done a very interesting study um, with uh, um, a community called Paraisopolis. You it, it's an, it's a, a, an informal settlement um, in Sao Paulo you, uh, that is very close to a very high income. So you might think you don't know um, Paraisopolis, but I'm sure that you have seen a photo that is the uh, big photo of a low income um, informal settlement uh, next to um, a, a high building with uh, different um, uh, with swimming pools in every um, balcony. You probably have seen that photo that's very, very famous. And what she worked with that community and they had to, you know, to contact the, the high powers inside the, the favela, the low, in, the, 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 um, the informal um, um, uh, settlement uh, in order to be allowed in. And, and then they've, they've done a series of, of interviews. This was uh, together with the World Bank. And they also got uh, people's mobile phones with, um, with an app that would track their, um, 
and movements. And they got some very interesting results uh, in terms of accessibility, but also kind of uh, looking into data that you couldn't have otherwise that is on in the informal job market. Um, so, for example, they found uh, that a lot of people um, that live in that informal settlement um, work nearby uh, in the high income um, uh, buildings, uh, probably like, uh, you know, maids or doing gardening or any sort of other uh, services. And this is something that we, we don't really have in any kind of official data set. Um, but yeah, and I, I think she has already published that study, so I could, I could find that um, uh, for you if you're interested, uh, Stefano. But there is a lot yeah, of absolutely. Data, I think, especially on where, um, you know, the kind of official data sets don't really uh, reach and the informal aspects of, of the, the global cities in the global south are, um, you know, are a particular point of interest. But then you get into other challenges on how you reach these communities, and uh, sometimes you you might need even um, um, you know the permission of <laughs> of the the, uh, the 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 high powers of a, of a, a Brazilian favela like they've done. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, and it's one o'clock now, so I will just conclude um, with one comment from Tiago again, uh, who said that it would be interesting to study these, um, these topics in metropolitan areas in the Amazon as well, where there is probably a much more mixed uh, population than Sao Paulo and Rio. I think that would be fascinating. I don't know whether you have any plans on that. Oh. Yeah, he's, he's suggesting two cities, I'm just looking at, at his comment, that is Manaus and Belém. Uh, interestingly, th those are the areas that were most affected by COVID in Brazil, so uh, I, I, I agree with, with him, uh, especially because you would have very uh, different uh, composition, in particular the indigenous uh, population is very high in those areas. So yes, thank you very much, Thiago, this is a very good uh, suggestion and uh, uh, I think I, I agree with you that we should include one of those uh, areas, at least in our um, uh, regional uh, comparison study. Thank you. Brilliant. So I will conclude just asking, um, well, thanking again, uh, Joanna, for a fantastic talk and for a very lively conversation. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming today. And please do, um, you know, do say something, say goodbye, say hello uh, in the chat. Uh, and again, many, many thanks, Joanna, for coming and for sharing your research with us. It's my pleasure. Thank you to everyone. And please do not hesitate in, in getting in touch by email.